Jim Hales and I are joined in the uh, studio this this afternoon. Our broadcasting headquarters. Our broadcasting headquarters nestled deep Luxurious in the, broadcasting headquarters. Yes. Yeah, deep in the bowels of downtown Tulalip, Marysville. Yeah. Yeah, I think I was uh, derided in an earlier episode for saying Puyallup by mistake. Yes, right? sure. <laughs> okay, so not Puyallup, Marysville and Tulalip. Hey, we are joined for this episode with a, a very, very serious guy who was the who was um, the executive producer for 15 years for a, um, a sketch comedy show called Almost Live. And legendary I think a, sketch comedy show. Legendary. And so I think our audience may recognize his name. Bill Stainton has joined us. And Bill, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Ken. Oh, it's a pleasure. Hey, Being here nestled in the bowels of Marysville. It's, just, you know, it's, it's, it's the dream. Well, it's the it's beautiful. It, this is a beautiful yeah. I would have said nestled in the foothills, but bowels. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Why not? We'll okay. go with that. All right. Well, it's your podcast. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Bill. Hey, almost live. You uh, you you your name is associated with that. Why would people remember you for that? Now, what was what was there about this uh, this show that uh, that made it so iconic? Oh, I think probably that that it was local. I mean, that was the thing that we were, you know, our job was to make fun of Seattle, the mm-hmm. Pacific Northwest, its neighborhoods, its customs, its people, that sort of thing. And um, we were on f- for our final 10 years. We were on just before Saturday Night Live. We were on from 1130 to midnight. SNL was on from midnight to uh, 130. And. And, SNL. and were you the warm-up act for Snow uh, exactly. for Saturday Night exactly. Live, or were they the, or, actually or the or were spoiler? They, were they the the ones who then put people to sleep after I, you had? Well, it depends on who you talk to. Uh, <laughs> we heard we heard it both ways. I know that Lauren uh, Michaels, the executive producer of SNL, was not thrilled to be pushed back in Seattle. We were the only market in the country that was able to do that. Um, but people would tell us they said, "Man, you you guys are so much funnier than Saturday Night Live." Which technically, on any given week, may or may not have been true, but I think what they were really uh, kind of latching onto was that we were local. We were making fun yeah. of things that were in, you know, if the Mariners played that day, we had jokes about it. Uh, you know, we would have guests on, um, you know, Gary Locke, the President of the United States. I mean, local people who they right. who they knew, which SNL couldn't do. Are you saying Gary Locke was the president for a while of the United States? No, or? but he. Well, um, th- the reason I. I Put those two together. I hadn't realized I'd done that. Uh, when he was the governor, um, we had him on one show. I think it was a. It, it must have been like a New Year's special or something because we uh-huh. had we had him on as the governor. But we also had the presidents of the United States of America. Uh-huh. You know, the yeah. man with Chris Ballou, yeah. and Dave mm-hmm. Netter, or that. Yeah. And um, one of my favorite introductions that I ever wrote. I decided to have him introduce them. And the introduction was, I may be the governor of the state of Washington, but these are the presidents of the United States of America. (laughs) SNL's not going to do that. You know, what's fun about presidents of the United States is uh, Chris Ballou. Um, You can catch him at uh, many of our libraries. uh, Casper Baby Pants? Casper Baby Pants. That is an amazing show. I saw him at the uh, Historic Everett Theater uh, a few months ago. Man, that's an amazing show. So the last time I saw him, he was at um, the Edmonds Library in the Plaza Room above. And uh, I hadn't been really aware. So my job is communications and marketing. And so Blue's going to be down there. The weather was going to be great. And I thought, hey, let's goose that a little bit. Let's see what we can do. So we did. And that might have been a mistake because he gets a crowd anyway. So I went, I happened to be going down there uh, while he was performing. I had forgotten about it. I, What's going on upstairs? Oh my God, it's Chris Blue. Um, and it was completely packed. It was a sunny uh, day. The doors were open. That plaza was filled with parents and kids. Yeah. It was so phenomenal to see uh, the kind of energy that he brings and then what people are expecting from it. It's really fun. Yeah. Yeah, he really knows how to draw a crowd. Yeah, it's great. So, But you, I digress. You were <laughs> executive producer. I was. For Almost Live. I was, I was the one that people would blame. And that's why you were so serious. <laughs> that's why I was yeah. so serious. Yeah. But you were also a cast member. I was. So, so what was that like having both of those roles? It was interesting. It was. Um, I mean, I'm I'm probably one of the least recognized cast members just because my main job was being the executive producer. So I wasn't. I mean, I was on every show, but not necessarily. You know, it's certainly not as much as say John Keister or 
Pat Cashman, Tracy Conway, people like that. So was that like being Stan Lee on on all of these Marvel movies? Pretty, pretty yeah, much <laughs> making <laughs> the cameo appearance. And... Some some weeks it was little more than a cameo. Uh, other weeks I had I had uh, uh, more of a more of a featured role. But it was interesting because um, I mean my my primary job was well there was a number number of jobs that an executive producer does decide who's going to be on the cast, who's not. I mean, basically, I was in, responsible for hiring and firing, if necessary, staff and cast and that sort of thing. Um, what I tell people is that if you saw it on the air, it's because I said so. If you didn't see it on the air, it's because I said so. Now, the truth told, truth be told, it was much more democratic than that. I mean, I'm dealing with a staff of like 10 people, all of whom were Emmy winners or multiple Emmy mm-hmm. winners. So, you know, they, they knew their stuff. I would put them up against anybody. Um, but sometimes if there was a debate, I mean, somebody somebody has to be the boss. At yeah. some point, somebody has to say, nope, we're not going to do this, or yes, we are going to do this. Uh, so so was was being fired uh, by you the same as, like, being fired by Donald Trump in The Apprentice? <laughs> so it's like, you know, you're my, almost, my claim to fame almost was identical. I was fired by Bill Stanton. <laughs> almost identical. My career trajectory has been different, but... Um, uh, <laughs> No, it was. So, uh, so you're saying there's no plans to run for 2020 for president I of the United States? I can neither States? confirm nor deny. Okay, stay tuned, folks. Yeah. <laughs> if you decide, will you come back here and do it live sure. here? I'll okay, do it good. live here. Right, I'll good. do it here. unless uh, unless Jimmy Fallon calls first. Well, we'll, fi- make, we'll make sure that doesn't happen. Okay. Yeah, fifteen. Okay. Well, fifteen years is a long time to have a television program. So that. There yeah, was some. There must have been some success around that. There was, and we never thought when 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 King started the show, all of us who were involved figured. Uh, and I, I I moved to and, Seattle in in order to do the show. I was uh, I started off in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, then moved to Portland, Oregon, hmm. then up to Seattle. I, I moved to Seattle specifically to do Almost Live, and I think all of us thought, okay, may, we'll do this for like the next two or three years, maybe five. I mean, I think that was like our outside dream that maybe we can milk this thing to five years. And um, <laughs> all of a sudden, 15 years later, we're all, you know, getting fat and bald, except for Tracy and Nancy. Um, but we're, and all of a sudden, you know, so when we started, we were all just in our 20s, hmm. uh, irresponsible kids in our 20s. And when we ended, we're all like, you know, oh, my gosh, we've crossed over into our 40s. And how in the world did this happen? And by that time, I... Bought a house, and I mean, so now, now I'm a Seattleite. I'm, you know, this is. So was that weird at, in your 20s to be come across the country and be given a show like this, given a mandate? I, actually, I'm surprised. I didn't realize that. So when you're talking about coming over to, just to do the show at King, yeah, um, I always imagined. Um, apparently wrongly, um, that uh, Almost Live w- was an organic growth out of uh, guys who were here and you got together and you had to talk somebody into the, at the TV station into letting you on the air. But, th- but it sounds way more intentional. Though. Well, there, there was part of that, but then they needed somebody to produce the show. Hmm. I mean, it was kind of organic as far as the germ of the idea, hey, we'd like to do this. And the great news at that time... Come on, time, kids, let's put on a show. Yeah, that's pretty much what it was. And at that time, uh, King TV was owned by Dorothy Bullitt, yeah. Mrs. Mm-hmm. Bullitt. And and she owned the whole broadcasting, you know, King yeah. Broadcasting, which had TV stations up and down the coast and in Spokane and radio stations. Where I worked. For, yes. You know, for a Bullitt station in that's Spokane. R- that's right. And uh, Mrs. Bullitt, always Mrs. Bullitt, um, she was like in her 90s. And she firmly believed, and you don't see this as much anymore, unfortunately, but she firmly believed that we were in business to serve the community. Hmm. That we are here to serve the community. Now, we're not a charity. I mean, we're going to make money while we're doing it, but we're here to serve the community. So the idea was that, you know, back in its golden days, the heyday, um, and I'm, I'm speaking as an, you know, somebody who's you know, worked there long ago. I'm sure the people who are working there now will tell you, you know, this is the heyday, but it's <laughs> not. Um, uh, in the heyday, you know, King King had a, you know, the number one news department, had a great investigative department, a great documentary department. So these are all ways to look at Seattle and the Pacific Northwest through different lenses. And all of a sudden, a comedy show is yet another way to look at, you know, to look at our community in, with a slightly different take. Yeah, because it wasn't just a comedy show. It was a, it was a focused local comedy show. It was looking at uh, the things that made made us what we were exactly and and taking a, a different approach to it yeah that was our strength so so the the initial idea so first of all so that was the context of king at the time that we want to do local we want to serve the community so hey kids let's put on a show 
But at some point, somebody's got to produce it. And um, they looked around the country twice, from what I've been told, to try and find <laughs> the right person. Uh, because they were looking for a specific combination of producing skills. They wanted somebody who knew how to do field production, where you take a camera out and you take things like Billy Kwan or the high five and White Guys or those kinds of things. But since it was also going to be done in uh, on Saturday, we brought a live studio audience in and taped the show live on tape in front of a studio audience with a with a um, with a studio crew. They wanted somebody who had that background as well, plus somebody who understood and spoke the language of comedy. And I, because of various things I'd done in my life, I happened to you know if it were a Venn diagram, I happened to be the middle of the <laughs> Venn diagram. I happened to be you know the one person where those were all that intersection. Uh, what, uh, well, the second it's person. It's called the sweet spot. The sweet spot. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. You, could, you. you tell I was fumbling and you bailed me out. That's what makes you so good, Ken. <laughs> so I was I was the only, well, like as I said, the second person, but Lauren Michaels already had a job. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, so they tapped me in to do it. And, um, and the really cool thing was, like, for the first several years, we were not good. I mean, we had our <laughs> moments. We had our moments, but first of all, we were on... For the first five years, we were on Sunday at 6 p.m. We were an hour-long show Sunday at 6 p.m. That's a terrible time slot for comedy. Yeah. yeah. But the really nice thing was back when we began in 1984, there were only the three stations. Yeah. I mean, Fox wasn't around. Cable wasn't a, you know, w- w- wasn't wait, around. Wait, 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 wait. We, we have to wait. Take a little b- pause here. Because millennials have no idea what you're talking about. That's true. They don't. They don't remember a world without 100 to 500 stations. Right. Or streaming. You know, I mean, you right. couldn't watch Almost Live on your iPad because the iPad didn't exist. It was a TV station. <clears throat> so was this black and white days? <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't quite black and white. Uh, but there was only King, King Como and Cairo. It was NBC, CBS, ABC. That's all Seattle had. And you took your remote to go to those three stations, Pretty right? Much, remote? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think I think he had remotes back then. And rabbit ears. But they were big remotes that clicked audibly. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the good news about that is that even if we weren't very good, which we were not because we were trying to figure out who we were, somebody was going to watch us because there just weren't any alternatives. <laughs> I mean, you know, so so we were we were allowed to be bad and figure out what our voice was, figure out who we were. That That couldn't happen nowadays. But um, we just the, the planets aligned. We happened to be at King TV, which the which was the perfect sized station for a show like this. It happened to be under the leadership of a woman, a visionary woman, who really got what broadcast TV can be and was at one point. Um, uh, unique combination of talents, and uh, and and the timing was great. So remembering this show uh, over those years. Do you have any favorite segments that that still come to mind, or or funniest segments? Yeah, or? there are a few that that I remember for various reasons. It's like if you ask Ringo Starr, and I'm sure you've probably had Ringo here, uh, or Paul McCartney, you ask them like, you know, so which songs do you like? And what both of them will tell you is that, well, when I hear one of our songs, I just think, oh yeah, I was fighting with John that day, or oh yeah, I was sick in the mm-hmm. studio but still had to, mm-hmm. you know, so you, they remember those kinds of things. Some of my favorite moments um, were when we had Bill Nye the Science Guy on. We invented mm-hmm. Bill Nye the Science Guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was he was one of my writers, and then a guest canceled, and Bill filled in, and um, and and it was a hit. But I maintain to this day that virtually nobody on the planet, and everybody on the planet knows who Bill Nye the Science Guy is now, but they've never seen him at his best, because the best Bill Nye the Science Guys were were in the rehearsals. Really? Because <laughs> that's when all the fun would happen and all the ad libs and that. And it was just hel- like tears down our cheeks. Funny, hilarious. Because you never, sometimes the experiment would work, sometimes it wouldn't work. And then about an hour later, after rehearsal, we'd, you know, we'd bring the studio audience in and then try and recreate that. And yeah. we did a good job with it, but it was never quite the same electricity. So th- that was a favorite. I remember once when we had uh, Joe Walsh on, uh, the guitarist for the Eagles. Yes. And um, at that time, we had a, we had a live band. That, uh, I think that's kind of brave to schedule Joe Walsh at that it was, point but in it his was, career. It was. It was. You cool. must have had a backup. Uh, no, no <laughs> backup. No, no. Wow. This was this was no net. This was season three, so we were still kids and didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> but we had a live band at the time, and I remember calling Joe because he was going to be on the on the show. I said, "Hey, listen, Joe." Um, this may be 
too big of an ask, but um, but we have a live band, and without pausing, he said, "Have them have them learn Rocky Mountain Way in G." You know, <laughs> spent the last year Rocky. That's a big Joe Walsh song, and um, and being in that studio as they ran through it the first time, there were only like five people in the studio. Our four person band, Joe Walsh and me. And it's like this is. This is great. Cool. I mean, this, that's the guy. That's right there. He's that's the guy. So those those were cool. And then um, uh, there was the time when we knocked over the Space Needle, and that kind of stands out. Um, we uh, it was an we were doing a live show on April first. I forget. So what that's year where it was. the crack came from. That's where the crack yeah. came from. <laughs> We did a live show on, on April 1st of whatever year it was. And we didn't normally do live shows unless it was like a New Year's special or something like that. And I, I don't know quite why it happened this way. It was a Saturday. And um, we interrupted our own opening with a fake newscast saying that the Space Needle had fallen over. <laughs> now, now in our defense, this was well before 9-11 and, you know, that kind of thing. But um, And we had... Uh, well before H.G. Wells did his we, yeah. Martian invasion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And, and we had our graphics department. Some say Wells makeup. took it from. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. We had our graphics department make up, uh, you know, some graphics here. The space needle all crumbled in, in Lower Queen Anne. We did make sure to say that because of some made up reason, nobody was inside, nobody got hurt. And we had April Fool's Day, you know, flashing on the screen. So we, did, we didn't think we'd fool anybody. So what happened was during the first break, because again, it's a live show, we have the live studio, and the, yeah. the stu- studio audience is laughing and. You know, we come back after the after the fake news cut in, and John Keister is the host, say, "Well, bummer about the needle," and um, <laughs> so clearly a joke. And then and then we we have a few more jokes, then go to commercial. At that point, the King Five receptionist races into the studio, which had never happened before. She runs up to me. I'm sitting at my producer's desk, and she said, "You have just overloaded and shut down the entire King TV switchboard." <laughs> Wow. It gets worse. You've also overloaded and shut down the entire Space Needle <laughs> switch, switchboard. It gets worse. You've also overloaded and shut down the entire 911 emergency system throughout all of Western Washington. So that was that was a memorable night. Oops. <laughs> yeah, oops. Oops. So the following day, Sunday, I'm on the phone with Space Needle lawyers all day long, and they're threatening to sue me personally, King TV, NBC, anybody involved. They're just lawsuit, 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 and you're damage saying, control. It was a joke. It's a <laughs> right, joke. Right, but um, yeah, so there's – but then on Monday, all of a sudden, it's front page news above the fold. Again, the kids won't know what that means, but it's you know, like <laughs> it's a, the big head. It's front page news above the fold in virtually every paper in the United States. I mean, people from, like, Tampa, Florida were sending me copies in Las Vegas. And, so, and, the, and all of a sudden, the same people from the Space Needle who have been threatening to sue me the day before on yeah. Sunday yeah. now called me and said, listen, Bill, um, how, how, how can we milk this thing? <laughs> <laughs> you get a free dinner out of it up there? Got no, nothing. Nothing. Got no. nothing. No, that was actually the only time that we ever apologized on the air. We apologized the following week. We were asked to apologize virtually every week by offended viewers. Yeah. I was going to say, you kind of, yeah. you apologize a lot, but that's the only time on the air. That was the only time on the air. Um, and, uh, and and the reason was because by shutting down the 911 system, we actually put lives in danger. Yeah. I mean, if you were having a heart attack or if like, I think there's somebody in the house. Well, bummer. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So I happened to be in Ballard yesterday driving Oh, good for so you. So whenever I drive in Ballard, I'm always thinking of Almost Live and Ballard. The Ballard Driving Academy. Ballard Driving Academy, yep. That's still one of <laughs> one of my favorites. And when people come up to me, it's always high-fiving white guy, Ballard Driving Academy, Billy Kwan. Um, but the thing about the Ballard Driving Academy, it's, it, it still holds up as a piece of comedy, but it's based on the fact that everybody in Ballard was old, slow, and Scandinavian. And that's not true, true anymore. It's not true anymore. Ballard's a cool area. So, like, <laughs> yeah. you, 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 so p- if people move to the area and they check out YouTube, oh, what's this almost live thing? And they find that and go, well, why is this? F- I don't get why this is funny. Because yeah. it's, <laughs> it's not the it same. T- it's, it's it not was the a same. snapshot yeah. in time. Yep. Yeah. And that's what made it really tough when we finally went off the air uh, when they fired. I mean, technically, we're still on the air. They're still running the reruns. Um, but in, in 1999, it was getting tougher and tougher because our, our – Bread and butter was the individual neighborhoods mm-hmm. and the personalities. Like Fremont had a personality, mm-hmm. Kent, Bellevue. You know, I mean, they, they were all. Now so you'd have to do Fremont nude. Yeah, right. <laughs> you so. would. 
But it started getting tougher and tougher because there's more money washed into the area. Uh, and at that point, it was pretty much all Microsoft money. But um, it's there started to be this homogenization mm-hmm. where everything was kind of this, everything became kind of this hip outer enclave of Seattle because nobody could afford to live in Seattle anymore. I mean, the same thing's happening now through the app, through Amazon and that sort of thing. And all of a sudden, you know, Frederick and Nelson is no longer, and we've got pottery barns every place, and, and just like yeah. every place else in the world. So it was really hard to find to find the comedy in. Up in, in, in a place where every, where there's a certain sameness to everything. Absolutely. So actually, that brings me to something that I'm really interested in hearing from you because, uh, yes, Almost Live is in reruns, um, but is. you're really busy now doing other things. Yeah. I really want to hear uh, what you've transitioned to and, and how that happened. So talk to us a little bit about what you're doing these days sure and where's that common thread because I think there is one well there is um, nowadays I basically live on airplanes I make my make my primary living is, is a keynote speaker I open and close a lot of conventions on Monday we're taping this on a Friday on on Sunday at 6 a.m. I catch a flight to fly to Atlanta where I'm gonna be the opening keynoter for the International uh, Facilities Manager Association of 1500 facilities management is people. our guy there Probably, yeah. probably, yes. probably going to be there, um, and so that's that's what I do, and I, I speak to all kinds of audiences, all kinds of associations and corporations about things like leadership and creative thinking and producing under pressure. Those are my three kind of key areas, all of which I got from Almost Live. Mm-hmm. So what happened was when um, they canceled the show. It, so in 1999, by that time. Mrs. Bullitt, the, you know, the founder and owner of King TV, had died. She'd been in her 90s, and the company was sold. So it no longer was owned by a family, by a person. It got sold to a company in Providence, Rhode Island, which then sold it to a company in Dallas, Texas, which mm-hmm. is where it was living then. At that point, we were just a line item on a budget. Mm-hmm. And they didn't really realize, oh, but no, Almost Live is kind of an important part of the fabric of, of, the, of the Pacific Northwest. It's just a line item. So let's just get rid of this. So they did. And that was a month after I'd bought a brand new house and a brand new car. <laughs> so that was a little difficult. You know, the timing was not was not ideal. Um, so I started thinking, I mean, I, I had some money saved up uh, and some things. But I started thinking, okay, what what can I do? So what, you know, because I, I need another gig. Because, you know, this, you know, you can't yeah. tell the bank, oops, sorry. Um, well, you can. Well, you but can then, try. Then, yeah. then, they, <laughs> then they take the house back. So, um, so I thought, well, what, what can I do? At that time, I mean, I thought to myself, okay, I'm a TV producer, but there's nothing else in the country that I would want. I mean, after Almost Live, where do you go? I'm not going right. to go produce. You know, and TV was, I mean, clearly changing, right? You were seeing that at King. It was, it was yeah, changing. so where do you go and do the same yeah. kind of thing? There is no place. Yeah. And I can't be a news producer. I mean, that's not my world. I know how to produce comedy. And I didn't, I didn't at that point, as I said, I'm in my 40s. I did not want to move to New York or L.A. I considered both of those. Mm-hmm. And I, I knew people at the Letterman Show and SNL and places like that. And. It just wasn't for me. I actually had explored that a few years before uh, and been very well received. But I realized I kind of like it in Seattle now. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, you know, I, this is kind of home now. Um, so I thought, what can I do? Okay, so TV producing is out because there's nothing that's in, that's intriguing to me. Well, I'm a joke writer also. I mean, I, I, by that point, I had written for The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. I'd written monologue jokes, things like that. I thought, well, maybe I can do that. Well, I mean... Leno, you know, that's the Tonight Show. It's as big as it was. They paid right. 50 bucks a joke. It's gonna, I'm going to have to sell a lot of jokes to pay my monthly mortgage. Yeah. yeah. His monologue's so, only so long. Exactly. Um, so I, I, there was a moment of panic. It's like, okay, so, I mean, what in the world is my skill set? You know, I mean, the things mm-hmm. I'm good at, there's not really a market for. I mean, Almost Live was the market. Um but then I, then I started thinking, okay, now wait a minute, let's, let's broaden the scope of what I know. For the last 15 years, I've led an amazing creative team to unprecedented results. I mean, I won a bunch of Emmy Awards. My staff- I How mean, many did you win? 29, yeah. just missed, missed number bummer. 30 by that much. Hmm. But, but my, my staff total, I mean, the, the total for Almost Live as, as a show and the staff was like over 100 Emmys. So that's pretty out, and we also had ten straight years of number one ratings, like wow. without a break, every single week, wow. even during vacation, during mm. hiatus, during reruns. You know, num- so okay, that's pretty impressive results. I led 
an amazing team to some amazing results in a very highly competitive world. That's a skill. I mean, that's that's right. an experience. Um, I also know a thing or two about creative thinking, about being innovative, on demand, week after week, because we had to. We had to be creative on demand. Most people think creativity is like, oh, there's a lightning bolt from the sky. Well, if you're waiting for that and that's your job. There's a process to creativity. Start. There's a process to it, and that can be learned and that can be taught, which is one of the things I talk about. And I also know a thing or two about producing amazing results under pressure. Mm -hmm. Because, look, it's not brain surgery. I'm not going into a military engagement or anything. But still, that clock is ticking. Mm -hmm. It comes up to 1130. You've got to, I mean, you, you can't say, oh, wait, hang on. We're not ready yet. You've got to produce results. And every week you get the ratings to see how you did. Plus, 175 people in the studio audience are judging you. And then a million more on TV an hour and a half later are going to be judging you. That feedback loop, when you mentioned the ratings, that feedback loop, that immediate feedback loop must be a curse and a blessing. It is. And the most immediate feedback loop, and this is the thing that always blows me away, and it still does today with what I do for a living now, is keep in mind that Almost Live was produced, written, and performed pretty much exclusively by multiple Emmy Award winning comedy people. We knew what we were doing. But it was that studio audience of 175 people who in all likelihood never written a joke in their lives who would tell us every single night whether or not we did our jobs well. It's like, right. I have 29 Emmys for this and you're telling me, yes, we're telling you that that didn't cut it. So you didn't have <laughs> just uh, sitting in reserve that laugh machine just in case they didn't laugh on No, on we probably should have thought of that. There were there were there were times where uh yeah, we played to some dead air, but and that's and that's the way it aired. It just it aired to dead air. We didn't do any sweetening or anything. So, as I recall, that was also part of the humor. So, when it bombed and you were, and I was watching, mm -hmm. uh, it that made it as funny. Yeah, it didn't feel me. that way. It didn't, <laughs> didn't, it didn't feel that way in real time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, glad you feel that way, Jim. Right. I don't think we right. the Look, bills proved it. Yeah. So to get back to your question, once I kind of put those pieces together, um, and actually there were some there were some other speakers, like keynote speakers locally, who knew who I was, and they said, "Hey, can you make my stuff funnier? Like I've got this speech, I'd like to be funnier." And so I started doing, mm -hmm. you know, writing jokes for other speakers, and the more I did that, the more I started to learn that this is actually a career. Yeah. I mean, there are people making money doing this. Yeah. So I started kind of exploring that arena, and it's kind of fortunate. Um, I mean, I know hundreds of professional speakers now. Um, but I had kind of a head start because it was really easy for me to get booked at first because I had celebrity value, mm -hmm. believe it or not, in Seattle at the time. Um, so I, I, do, I do believe that. So, <laughs> I, do. So, so I could... So you get booked fairly easily, not for much, you know, $100 here, $500 there, something like that, but still enough to kind of learn what I was doing. And mostly what I would do there is a bunch of comedy things. i tell some almost live behind the scenes mm -hmm. stories, things like that. Um, but that's not what you're doing now, right? That's not what I'm doing now because I can't go to Atlanta, Georgia and, and tell almost, almost live behind the scenes. Now I can tell some, I can tell some stories about, you know, some things that Jerry Seinfeld said to me that have had a lasting You can do some name impact. dropping and that gets you I can do some, some name dropping. I can talk about Bill Nye, the science guy. Uh, for this group on Monday, the, the facilities managers, I'm going to tell them about the time that we lost a 12-foot boa constrictor in the building, and our facilities manager had to deal with that. <laughs> Never found the snake, by the way. No idea whatever happened to it. Um, I, I have a theory that it, in seeking its own kind, it went down to the newsroom, but I can't prove that. <laughs> but um, So I can do that, but uh, I realized that if I, was, if, if I were going to expand beyond just – the local market who already knew me and knew Almost Live, I had to expand what I talked about. And that's when those three three areas I talked about before, leadership, creative thinking, producing under pressure. Well, those are universals. Mm -hmm. So now, and, and I can look at them from a different, from an interesting way. So I can go talk to, uh, you know, the Steel Workers Association or, um, you know, Coca-Cola or someplace like that about leadership, but I can tie in Here's what I learned from Jerry Seinfeld. Here's what I learned from working with Ellen DeGeneres. Here's what I learned from... So it's interesting because that, those are cool stories. That's fun. So when you're going and doing one of these uh, these keynotes mm -hmm. um, or other speaking engagements, you get you are getting immediate feedback from the audience because you are live uh, and doing that. But Same I'm, thing, yeah. But I'm wondering what you're hearing back from uh, 
from the corporate folks who the organizer wa- the organizer yeah. the people who uh, wanted you to come uh, saw some value in the message behind that uh, how are they receiving that and, and what are, what's the, the value they're looking for well I keep getting booked so the reception <laughs> seems to be good um, you know I am I am paying for the house so that's yeah. that's good um, yeah I, I, are you just ubering now the car's gone pretty much, yeah no, okay. yeah exactly right. No, I get good response because the the person who hires me, the the, the meeting planner, the, the um, they're basically looking for two different things. There, there are kind of two outcomes that they're concerned about. The one is the outcome for the for the audience, like are they getting what they need? Um, you know, are they getting things from me that will make them a better leader, that will make them a more creative leader, that will help them lead their teams mm-hmm. better in a high pressure situation, for example? You know, are are they getting that? Uh, so that's the need of the audience, which, of course, the meeting planner is concerned with, uh, the, the, the attendees' needs. But the meeting planner has his or her own needs, which is I, – I tend to be either an opening or a closing keynoter. So it's, is the audience engaged? Are they laughing? Mm-hmm. Uh, I've, I had one meeting planner tell me – because I, you know, I thanked her for bringing me in. I said, I realize it's you know, – unless you've actually seen me before, it's a roll of the dice. I mean, you, you go to websites and you pick one and you hope that they're going to be good. And she said, I never relax until I hear the first laugh. And so once you hear that, so uh, the meeting planner's uh, desired outcome is she wants her attendees to think, oh, wow, this is, I am so glad I came. This is great. And then if I'm the opening keynoter, they go into the rest of the sessions feeling like this is going to be awesome. So, and and that's, that's, mm. a, that's a different outcome. And I've got to be able to provide both those outcomes. Mm-hmm. That's interesting how you're viewing the needs of the folks that you're dealing with and a little separately, right? So you've got meeting plan needs, you've got corporate needs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They overlap. So basically what you've got to do is you've got to create a compelling, worthwhile, valuable message in a way that is entertaining enough that they feel like this is a great show. Because, again, as an opener or a closer, you need to do that. If you're in the middle or, you know, that can be more heavy content, things like that, or if you're doing a breakout session – but if they're if they're trusting you to to open their whole convention, uh, they're they're putting a lot of faith in you. Well, Bill, I'm really fascinated by um, with what you've shared with how you made that transition, and because I I keep uh, coming across individuals uh, in through my personal and professional life who they've they've essentially um, been uh, they've been confronted with with similar issues. They they've enjoyed a certain level of success or at least being able to get along. Mm-hmm. Uh, things are kind of moving along, chugging along, and then suddenly <clears throat> something changes and they've now forced to reevaluate um, where do they go from here. And That's that, a tough place to be. And and as you, what I was hearing you say is, you know, you have to really take stock of w- who am I, what do I do, what have I been, and what do I know how to do and then where are the opportunities for me to try and apply that? And sometimes the, the immediate things you look at are not really where the opportunities are anymore. Yeah, you've got to be able to take a broader picture. And in the moment, that's difficult because um, in the moment you're thinking, well, if I'm not that anymore, who am I? Like if, I, if I'm mm-hmm. not the producer of Almost Live anymore, who am I? If I'm not getting the perks. I remember the first time when – Something came to town, some show, some concert, whatever it was, and um, I wanted to go see it. And I, I was like, "Oh wait, I, I have to buy a ticket." <laughs> How do you? Because for 15 years, I never had to buy a ticket to anything. I mean, they just they would just show up on my desk. Usually, backstage passes. They would just they would just show up. Mm. So, um, so it's like, well. If I'm not the person who gets the free, I mean, I don't know how to do this. I don't know who I am, if I'm, especially if it's, a, if it's a role that's fairly right. public. Mm-hmm. If you're the CEO of a major company or something like that. I mean, if, if, if it's a role where, where there's a lot of prominence to it mm-hmm. and that comes to an end, that's, that's really difficult. And in that moment, all you can think about is what you've lost. Because that's what happens when, with, with change. Mm-hmm. Uh, change is another topic that occasionally I'll weave into what I'm talking about. Um, when faced with change, people first and foremost go to what they're going to have to give up, what they're going to lose. Because, and that's, you know, reptile brain stuff. That's, that's just the mm-hmm. instinct of, you know, am I going to get eaten or not? Um, and it takes, it takes some perspective, which can be time, it can be distance, it can be any number of things, to be able to look at that broader picture, just like I had to go through and go, mm-hmm. well, I'm a, 
I'm a TV producer, I'm a joke writer. Because those were the immediate things. And, but it took, it took a little while before I could think, wait a minute, I'm, I'm actually more than that. And that's that's what people need to do in those circumstances. It's it's a, I, I, yeah, it's it's a tough place to be. Yeah, no managing your own change transitions is just as tough as managing a, a company's uh, need to to transition through change. It is, which is why sometimes it's good to get an outside perspective. It's good to get some help, whether it's through a professional career counselor or a therapist or just you know a, or someone a, like you someone someone like me somebody sensitive <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no don't call me i hate everybody um <laughs> but you know it's a, you know a spouse a significant other a, a group of friends whatever just to be able to give you some perspective because sometimes we're just so close to it we can't really see what our strengths really are because we're just you know we're so close and we tend to take our strengths for granted also because once you get to a point where something comes easily to you you tend to value it less because you think, well, if it's this easy, it can't be that valuable. Like I remember with, um, with some of my fellow speakers, they're incredibly envious about the fact that I can write humor, that I, that I can write jokes. And to me, it's like that's almost like taking dictation. It's so easy. But to them, it's like, we'll pay you lots of money to do this. I said, no, I'll just do it for free. Shut up, Bill. Let them pay you lots of money. <laughs> Well, you've also written a number of articles, and uh, there was an uh, there was an article that you wrote that where you where um, that, w- that was about encouraging bad ideas, and there was a there was a quote that you had in it about you never know which is the idea that leads to the idea. Oh yeah, oh that was a good and, one. And <laughs> yeah, this, <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> I'm glad you agree. So, th- just talk me talk to me a little bit about about that because is, is that where creativity really comes from? It it is it is one of the places because creativity really is all about connecting dots. It's not about the lightning bolt coming out of the sky. A, the, a creative idea is almost almost never. I'm not I'm not going to say it never happens, but it's almost never something that nobody ever heard of before. What it is is somebody combining two or more mm-hmm. things that nobody had ever tried to combine before. Uh, so. And in order to do that, you've got to be open to everything. One of our cardinal rules around the Almost Live writing table was no self-censorship. Mm. Um, around that table, anything and everything was said. Uh, I used to say, but it doesn't seem to be the case anymore, that I could never run for public office because at some point somebody's <laughs> going to say, well, Mr. Satan, isn't it true that at one point you said it almost doesn't matter how that sentence is going to end? Probably right. yes. Because you know, we said horrible things around that table just yeah. in – because you never know, okay, that uh, clearly we can't do that on television. But what if we take that idea and do this? And it's the same thing uh, in, in, in the corporate world. If you want that breakthrough idea, you've got to be open to all the ideas, the bad ones as well. Now, you might, in a, if you're in a corporate boardroom or a corporate, you know, if, if your team is having a meeting, you may not be able to go as far as we did with Almost Live because otherwise you're going to have a nasty meeting with the head of HR. Yeah. Uh, but. You've got to figure out where your own limits are, but within those limits, no self-censorship because, yes, somebody, you know, Frank might give an idea that is clearly outlandish and stupid and could never happen. So you've got two choices. You can either shut that down or Julie can say, you know, that, that won't work. But, but there was one thing you said in there that if we could take this, you know, because clearly we can't do what Frank said, but – that makes me think of this, mm-hmm. which might be doable. And it may almost have al- almost have nothing to do with what Frank said. Somehow it just triggered something in her mind. But that trigger wouldn't have happened if Frank had not felt free to say the stupid idea, the idea that leads to the idea. Because you never know what idea that's going to be. We all have all these connections in our minds. So if somebody says something... Oh, yes, I had a hot dog yesterday. <gasps> that reminds me about when I was in Italy. But really, what's the connection there? It doesn't matter. There's a connection in my own mind, yeah. and that leads onto the Italy thing. And the mm-hmm. Italy thing might be the million-dollar idea. It doesn't matter where the connection came from, but it came from someplace, and there was somehow two synapses in my brain connected hot dog with Italy for some ridiculous, stupid reason. The reason isn't important. What's important is that the connection was made and then all of a sudden there's the next million dollar idea. So you know what I love about about uh, your response to that is it is it leads me right back to um, <laughs> why you and I actually met. And we met uh, because that was, that was a dark day. 
Uh, I think you're right. It was fairly dark. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was overcast <laughs> in Mukilteo, Washington, which is where you live. That's where I live. And uh, we met at a, at a little cafe, and we were chatting about um, your being uh, part of our TEDx Noah Libraries, I think, 2017 event. I think that's correct. And, um, at Kamiak High School. At Kamiak High School. And the reason why this comes to mind is that with TED and TEDx, um, as, a, as an organizer, one of the things that I learned was TED is, is all about spreading ideas worth spreading. Correct. And, and as you said, there are, there are very few of maybe, not, maybe none new ideas, but there are recombined ideas that exactly. suddenly kind of pop out in ways that are fresh and refreshing and maybe take your mind into to a different place can right. take others to different places and those are ideas worth spreading and um, you have done your own TED talk I have uh, TEDx talk at, I think at Stanley Park Stanley in, Park in Vancouver yep. the Queen Elizabeth Theater yeah which so, is so cool because the last time I had been there was to see Phantom and now, and now, well, here I am. And then you were the Phantom. In the I was the time Phantom. There, yes, so. yes. I sang whatever the Phantom song is. So, uh, what the neat thing about your talk there, which uh, we're going to include the link to that in our show notes. So, oh, cool. uh, Thank for, you. for uh, audience listeners, please uh, click on that link and, and watch uh, Bill's talk. He starts out with this with this question to the audience: How many? I think it's how many of you like sitting next oh, no, to a was, weird person? Yeah, it or was. Something? It was. Do you do you like sitting next to weird people? Yeah. Do you like sitting next to weird people? Yeah. Which, uh, you know, if I were to ask our group here as we sit around the table, <laughs> uh, who do you seek uh, out? Obviously, we do. When so. you're flying southwest, who do you seek to sit down, out right. next, next to? Right. right. <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah, and it was actually, a, and I, I lead into a story that happened on an airplane with somebody sitting next to me. I won't spoil it for yeah. those who want to see the TED Talk. But that, uh, you know, you, I think in that talk, you talk a little bit about creativity and, and, and um, it's, so for the audience, it is well worth watching. It is, thanks. It's, it's a, it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm biased, of course, but I, I think it's a pretty good TED Talk, um, TEDx Talk, technically. But you know, we, we, you bring up the the, the TED event that, that you coordinated. Um, a, a TEDx event is kind of like that because you see all these speakers. Like you know, it's, it's a day or or a half day mm -hmm. of speakers, so you, you might sit through, um, you know, a dozen, a dozen and a half different speakers, all of whom talk about various different things mm -hmm. that that seem to have no connection. But as the day goes on, you start to make connections. Oh. Well, this is similar to what that person, you know, this person is a restaurateur who's talking about, you know, uh, how to hire a, a, a saucier. And this person is talking about, this person was, uh, I, I believe, one of the women we had at, at, at the TED Talk, mm -hmm. the, the TEDx Talk, you know, was, was an astronaut. Yes. And all of a sudden you start to see, oh, it's similar processes that they're going through. I, I'm, I'm seeing a similar thought process. So this... And that, that's one of the magic questions that, that you can think is, like, how is this like this? How is being a restaurateur like being an astronaut? And you think, well, they're not. I mean, you know, the boring person would say, well, they're just not. And that's the end of the conversation. The more interesting <laughs> person, though, is like, well, let's think. And that's when the connections happen. When you start to see, you know, how, when you kind of force your brain to find connections that may not be there. I'm curious about your experience with uh, with with creating your TED Talk. So I've had the privilege of watching uh, three uh, TEDx Snow Libraries events be created. Yep. Watch those speakers come in, uh, seeing seeing the applications, seeing them come in for that first orientation, not have a clue about what they were about to go through, right. and then come out the other end uh, transformed. Um, but but you've had a ton of experience on camera, on stage, in front of large groups. How did TEDx? How did that TEDx experience of preparing that? Uh, how did that work for you? How did that compare to your your other experiences? Well, I don't think I've ever rehearsed any speech as much as I rehearsed that one. Mm -hmm. uh, because one, because the timing is so tight. You know, if I'm doing a one hour keynote. I can I can be a little loose. I can play with the audience. If something happens, I can play off of that. Um, with a TEDx talk, you don't really have that luxury. Now I did a couple times just because I kind of had to. I mean, something you know, things happen and you can't not respond. But you're always aware of the timing. So 
it's kind of like uh, when I was when I was in college, I, I took a poetry course. I was an English major for a short time until I realized, ooh, I want to make money. Um, <laughs> but there was a poetry course, and a professor, a guy named Sanford Pinsker, I m- the only thing I remember him saying is, in a well-written poem, Everything that's there is there for a reason, and everything that isn't there isn't there for a reason. If a word is capitalized, it's capitalized for a reason. If there's a comma here, it's there for a reason. Nothing, you know, well-crafted poem, because there's, because a poem is such a tight piece of writing. There's no root, really, just like a joke. In a well-crafted joke, there's nothing there that isn't there for a reason, because there's no mm-hmm. slop. There's no room for slop. That's kind of the way it is with a TEDx talk. In a one-hour keynote, there can be some. Okay, maybe maybe I shouldn't use the word slop. I'm refer- referring to my own work. <laughs> There's room for extraneous genius, <laughs> but with a TEDx talk, um, capitalized E. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. N-G. Yeah, E-G. yeah. Uh, with a TEDx talk, so much of it was is cutting. You know, you kind of you come up with a first draft and then a second draft, a third draft, and you're almost never adding material. You're almost always cutting, refining. How can I say this? In fewer words, I remember Jerry Seinfeld told me once that for him, for him, a good day's work is taking an eight-word sentence down to five words. Mm. That's a good day's work for him because it's all about how can I say this in as concise and powerful a way as possible. Mm. And so when you do that with a TEDx talk, it's like learning a poem or learning, you know, a, a song or something like that. You can't just riff on stuff. You've got, I mean, you've, you kind of have to know it cold um and that's not typically uh where i live as a as a speaker um so that was um yeah, yeah so it's it was different it it, yeah really different. yeah yeah it's different and you know it, it was a big audience it was 2500 people which i've spoken to before but it's you know it's a big audience it's you know it's the queen elizabeth theater uh the audience is kind of dimly lit so you can't really see them which i i didn't like it often i i like being able to see the audience and kind of play off of their reaction, because as a speaker, one of the things you find out, whether it's a TED talk or a, or a keynote or whatever, it's 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 a dialogue. I mean, you may be the one doing all the talking, but it's it's a dialogue. Yeah. You're, you're, They're you're speaking f- to you through their body language and, exactly. and, and their eyes, their eyes, and right, right, right. So you can tell, oh, they're really digging this part, or oh, I think I'm losing them. I, yeah. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So you were a speaker at, at, at for TEDx Stanley Park, and then you were an MC for us. At the TEDx Yeah, that was a tough job. So why is MC a tough job? Well, first of all, because you have to realize that you're not the star of the show. And, I'm, you know, I've got 29 Emmys. Come on, I'm used to being the star of the show. <laughs> but as an MC, it's not about you. Yeah. I mean, you had, what, maybe, I think there were, what, maybe a dozen? Yeah, we had 11 speakers. Yeah, yeah, 11 okay. speakers, all of whom all of whom were amazing. And that's, that's another thing that's amazing because at the rehearsal the night before, Yeah. They were not all amazing. There were some where you thought, "This, I don't think this is going to go well at all. And somehow, I think I actually wrote a blog about this the following day, they all somehow rose to the occasion, which yeah. is just incredible to me. They, they, they all did, did uh, a great job. So the job of the MC is not to be the star of the show. I mean, obviously you want to interject some energy when it's, ne- when it's necessary. Mm-hmm. And, and we talked about that sometimes during yeah. the breaks. Okay, you need to, you know, get a laugh in there or something like that. Okay, so I'll do that. Um, but I've, I've always said the role of an MC is to be an entertaining traffic cop. I mean, your job is to get from point A to point C without making B the star. Hmm. That was a weird analogy. I'm not sure that really worked. But. Oh, I, yeah, it, it works it in works. A, kind of an odd way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take that. But, but we're coming to expect that. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, I'm curious about um, how that experience is impacting you now. Again, so again, I've seen so we've had fifty odd speakers come through mm-hmm. TEDx Snow Libraries, and uh, after the fact, uh, the feedback we get is that it was somehow transformational for them. And like there's whatever they learned in that process, um, not, not so much what they said, but the process of being able to do it uh, ends up becoming something that they're using in their rest of their life. Has, did that work that way for you? It it did, uh, probably in similar ways and also in dissimilar ways, because I am a professional speaker. So for me... And know, not just a professional, but a certified 
I'm a certified speaker speaking professional. professional. I'm, a, yeah. I'm a CSP. That's our that's our that's the National Speakers Association highest earned designation. So yes, I'm I'm one of those. Fewer than ten percent of speakers in the world hold the CSP, but I'm one of them. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Um, so I got things out of out of doing my TEDx talk in Stanley Park that would not necessarily be of interest to some of the other people who were on the stage with mm-hmm. me. Um, it's a five camera shoot, uh, so you get great video. You're in front of twenty five hundred people and. Fortunately, I got a really nice standing ovation at the end, so that's what we call the money shot. I mean, you know, you want that. Um, I got a great story, the story I start with, uh, which is the airplane story. Again, I'm not going to tip it, but that's one that I had never even thought about using before. It was just an incident that had happened to me a few years before, and all of a sudden, I was talking with somebody and looking for an opening. They said, well, well, have you ever had blah, blah, blah? I thought, you know what? There was this one time that... I can't tell you how many people come up to me and say, you know, I watched your TED, I thought, wow, that, that first story, that, that was almost like a throwaway idea. I've opened so many speeches with that now. Mm. Uh, because, so that's great. I think beyond what it gives me as a professional speaker, though, and what I see in other people who have done TEDx talks, is you kind of get a sense of confidence and self-worth. I mean, one, it's great to get up there and get some applause. But for a lot of people, this wasn't the case for me with what I was talking I was talking about creativity and things like that. But there are a lot of people who give TEDx talks who are really revealing about things, things about themselves, like really personal mm-hmm. stories yeah. that they may not have told anybody before. And you see this catharsis when they can tell it to an audience who accepts and embraces their their bravery, their story, um, and actually get something from it. You you almost see their posture change as they're going through you know as you know during the course of their twelve minute talk, mm-hmm. um, and then you talk to them afterwards, and they just feel great about themselves. Now, look, I'm not unrealistic enough to think that that changes their life forever. It might, <laughs> but at least again, sometimes they are talking about the most difficult day or the most difficult. Yeah circumstance of their lives and again getting a positive response to that all of a sudden reframes it it's still a terrible thing that happened but now they can get power from it it's no longer owning them yes. they are now owning it and i see that time and time again in tedx talks yeah mm-hmm. i think there's something so powerful about whether it's um, essentially sharing a personal experience or sharing an idea that um that you think is important and getting the validation and the acceptance from the audience right. that potentially can be life-changing. If not life-changing, it's still powerful enough in, in, in providing kind of a sense of um, I, people see me, they know me, right. they accept me. Yeah. Well, I think um, uh, Sargun Honda was one of the, one of the speakers at the, at the TEDx talk that, that, uh, or th- that, yes. I, that I emceed. I think her life has changed. I mean, she's become quite an influencer. And she was a, I think, 16, 17-year-old yeah. um, at, the, at that high school who got up on stage and kind of delivered her talk. Yeah. And it was a, it was a tough talk. I mean, it was, it, was a, it was a tough thing she was talking about. I'm, I'm, again, go, go see it. You know, yes. go, go online. Yeah, we'll, and, we'll listen in the show and, notes. And, and see it. Um, I actually ran into her at the, at the QFC in Mukilteo uh, a couple weeks ago. And she, she's just like... You know, there's an energy, there's a spark to her. Now, in fairness, there was before. I mean, she was always kind of, you know, I mean, there was something in her personality anyway. But but she's just, um, she's a strong person. Right, and she is. And I think. She's a remarkable human being. She is. And, and, and I think that was always there. But I think her TEDx experience has magnified it. And also been a mirror to her to kind of validate that, yes, I am an extraordinary person. And it gives her a framework to share, right? So yeah. go, going through the TEDx process um, gives you this new framework of how to share what you what you think you have, the value you have. Um, yeah, which is a really good thing. When we talk about the tightness of, of a TED Talk, yeah. that you know nothing extraneous, a lot of times when people talk about, Whatever their story is, they'll they'll ramble all over the place and they like, what's the? I don't get what the point is, and therefore the point isn't made, or at least not in a very powerful way. But you're right; they're going through this experience of learning how to tell the mm-hmm. story in a way that has maximum impact. That's hugely valuable. Mm-hmm. That, that's that's a really good point, Jim. I, that's I wouldn't expect that from you. 
Well, I'll tell you that <laughs> people uh, rarely do. You know, being in your presence, Bill, and presence of our uh, technical producer who is sitting here on the side and ha- making sure everything sounds right, um, the skills that the two of you have uh, just remind me that my family typically tells me when I try and tell a joke, they tell me, don't give up my day job. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, I wanted to, um, in the last few minutes we have, I wanted to um, kind of draw you back to your roots. You, because you mentioned, uh, I think, Ellen DeGeneres, Jerry Seinfeld, mm-hmm. Bill Nye, uh, Mr. Walsh of the Eagles, Walsh, a Jay number Leno. of, you know, yeah. Jay Leno, a number of big names, and I'm sure you could l- rattle off many others. Mm-hmm. And, um, and evidently, You've been speaking to um, speaking to groups as a keynoter for probably a l- number of uh, corporations and uh, and associations that people would recognize the names oh, yeah. of. You Emmy, you know, um, multi Emmy winner, mm-hmm. uh, Emmy Award winner. Uh, now now years, you're just embarrassing. Yeah, me. Well, all the all the years of uh, success with your. Um, with the, I am so with curious almost where lives. this is going. <laughs> All of but me too. So and yet you're just a terrible human being. <laughs> How is that possible? Why do good things happen to bad people? Well, that's a big question, Ken. But uh, actually, that's not where I was heading. But uh, huh, okay. but if you'd like to pursue My that bad. one, that, that, that no, angle, I'm, we can no, go. I probably there. should probably shouldn't have said that. Probably shouldn't <laughs> have that. Well, well, we can edit that out. Well, I, I where I was going to go was where you know all of that success that you've had and and that you've achieved. And you're from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I am Lancaster, by the way. Lancaster, Lancaster, sorry. Lancaster. Lancaster. Yeah. And which I, my wife and I, had the opportunity to drive through last year. A beautiful country. It is and farm country. Farm country. Mm-hmm. So, when you were six, seven, eight years old, did you have any idea that this was where your life was going to be headed? Yes, I knew exactly. That I was going to get twenty on Emmys and hang out with rock stars like Pearl Jam and Nirvana. Yes, that's exactly what I what I envisioned. No, of well, course tell not. Me, tell me about of that. Of course not. My backyard growing up was an Amish dairy farm. Now we weren't Amish, but you know, but our neighbors in the back it was an Amish dairy farm. I mean, I can I pretty sure with muscle memory I could still milk a cow. If you know, if if push came to shove, I think I could do that. Um I th- I don't think you ever forget that. Um <laughs> Yeah, I bet not. Yeah, probably not. Uh so no, of course not. I mean I I you know, when I first went to college I thought, okay, maybe I'll be an English teacher. Um you know, you just don't don't think of those things, and I've I've always kind of thought there are there are two ways to be successful in life. One uh, is uh, um, one is to know where you want to go, like figure out this is what I'm looking for. This is you know this is the mountaintop. This is what I want to reach, and then designing your life to hit that peak. Uh, Ross Schaefer, who was the original host of Almost Live, Mm -hmm. uh, is very good at that. He sets a goal. This is what I want to do. Now, what do I need to learn? Who do I need to to meet? What do I need to, you know, what do I need to do to get there? Um, And he does that long term. Some of us do short term. Short term. And then there's the other way, which is the way that I, I don't think I just, I chose. It's just, it's just the way it happened with me is you start down one path and all of a sudden you get to a fork in the road and think, oh. Which one seems to be more in keeping of where I want to be? I, even if you don't know where you want to be. Okay, well, let's take this fork. And then you do that and it leads to another fork. Like, I, as a six-year-old, you know, in the shadow of the dairy farm, I could never have predicted almost live. It didn't exist. A te- you know, if, if you want to do a comedy show, it was, you know, it was New York or L.A. It was the Carol Burnett show. So, I mean, those are unreachable. You'd never thought, well, maybe in Seattle they'll invent a show that blah, 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 blah. Um, that was just one of those forks in the road. And there's all of a sudden there's an the opportunity. I'll do that. Um, so it was not part of any great plan. And I envy those people who can do that. I envy the Ross Schaefer's. Ross Schaefer, by the way, is worth a lot more money than I am right now. Um, so because that's not a bad way to do it. Say, this is what I want. This is the goal. And let's do what it what it takes to get there. Um, that That wasn't my path, though. So it's. I think it's pretty remarkable that with the forks in the road that you that you that came came at you that you continue to move either to the right fork or to the left fork. And um, one of one of the things that I, I was, whenever I came to one of those forks, one of the questions I would ask myself is which is the safe route, and that I would always try and take the other one. 
because the safe route's only going to give me more of what I already have. And you don't learn, you don't grow through that. Mm -hmm. So I would always try and take the one that had a little bit more risk, as long as it fit uh, other criteria. But that's that was always kind of, you know, which one's going to stretch me a little bit more? So is, it, is that the subject of or an angle that you take in any of the talks that you give? Not up until now. I, so I was just going to say, I mean, I think, you know, as you're talking about that and talking about the, the way you've approached uh, how you ended up here today, for mm -hmm. example, uh, how that also applies to what you were talking about creativity um how you're you've got an idea it that's not exactly that path that doesn't look like it's going to work but you know what there's this other path that takes off on the side here and we yeah. can go that way and maybe there's another and it angles off this way and it angles off that way you know i was thinking about as you were talking about that uh about creativity and the message you give to corporate uh clients um that that must be empowering for them to see a, a possibility of of bringing creativity to their organization, to their meeting, to their project, to their something, and that they can they can see how that occurs. Uh, and and part of it is what you were just describing with your own life is is forks, uh, and being able to have this process and it's okay. Back to that no bad idea, right? Uh, yeah, I think that's true. And uh, another thing, very similar to that, is a lot of times they're kind of amazed that oh my goodness we are creative. I mean, like I've I've given creativity workshops to uh, to tax accountants, to lawyers, to people that you wouldn't think of as because most people think, oh, well the, well, the creative types, those are the you know the dancers, the poets, the singers, the actors, you know, the painters, that kind of thing. No, that's that's just that's one um, delivery channel for creativity. We're all creative. Create creativity is just you know putting together a couple of things and coming up with a better way of doing something. You mm -hmm. know, and it, it can come from. It can come from anywhere. So, uh, so can I jump in sure. on the, the analogy of the fork in the road? Because it just occurs to me, uh, listening to you talk and, and then Jim's question, that that fork in the road, you don't always see the fork. All you see is that suddenly a tree has fallen across your path. <laughs> yeah, right. Or it, does, it does look like that or suddenly too. the Or suddenly the ground has opened up and there's a chasm um, uh, you know, the, the road leads right into a chasm. Right. And it's the fork is actually the choice of where do I go from here? And that's the key word. There's a choice because so. a lot of times we don't, you know, again, in the moment, kind of what we were talking about, if you lose a position and, you know, what do I do now? Uh, it's easy to forget that there is a choice. So is that the nature of improvisation? Is that what improvisation is really about? Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, improvisation, if, if you're talking like you know, comedic improvisation or something like that, um, or musical improvisation, it's all about making a choice in the moment. Hmm. Uh, a, one of the greatest jazz pianists ever, a guy named Oscar Peterson, uh, phenomenal. If you have never listened to him, listen, I mean, he's just he's he could do anything. He's he's gone now, but um, at, at lightning speed. I mean, he was just amazing. I had a chance to interview him once, and um, I'd done my research, and one of his old piano teachers back in Canada, he's, he's a Canadian guy had said, I don't think Oscar's fingers could make a mistake if they wanted to. So wow. I so I said that to Oscar. He laughed and said, What she said that? He said, No. He said, Look, let me just tell you, I make mistakes all the time. But here's what happens. Let's say I'm doing a run, and for him a run would be like, you know, sixty fourth notes or hundred and twenty eighth, you know, the yeah. blitzkrieg, lightning fast. And I mean to end on an E flat, but my finger slips and ends on E instead. Well, that just changes the, harmon the, 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 you know, yeah. the harmonics and the dynamics. So I'll just change based on that. Now, again, that's happening in probably a hundredth of a second, but that's, that's improvisation. That's like, that's that tree in the road, that E instead of the E flat. Okay, what do I do with that now? Because, you know, because you have a choice. Oh, now I can, and sometimes it's like, oh, now, I, now it opens up a new path that I never would have seen before if that tree hadn't fallen. So, yeah. yeah you're at, so, cho yeah, choice is a real key word there. Yeah, because I, I think that in some ways, really, companies themselves, when they're talking about being agile, that yes. really they're, they're considering whether or not they can improvise. Can they take a real-time situation and change on a dime based upon that right. and not lose themselves as they essentially go off maybe in, in, in uncharted territory. Yes, yeah. Which is risky, because if you're talking about, about a corporation, there's there's money at stake. Right. Uh, so it, it can be, like, it's not terribly risky if you're playing piano and you hit a wrong note and do something different. There's not a lot at stake there. 
the more the more there is at stake, the more difficult it is to improvise, to take risks, to be creative. But without doing that, your 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 business, your corporation, your industry is going to slowly die, or quickly die. Um, <laughs> you, you've you've got to be willing to take those risks and embrace the change and. and be willing to be creative. Be willing to play like, what if? What if we were to do this? How is this like that? Who else has solved a problem like this? Mm-hmm. To ask those kinds of questions. Right. Well, it's been really intriguing. Uh, this is exactly what I wanted to hear and explore with you because I, you know, I I was a big fan of Almost Live. Was past tense. Am okay. No, I understand. I well, understand. I no, so okay. No, people's tastes change. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't share my actual favorite episode. I'm going to leave that for after the mics go off. Um, so, um, but but taking those lessons and how they become life lessons for personal uh, needs and for in the business realm, uh, and there really are parallels. Yeah, it's, it's it's really intriguing. I mean, it turns out it's the same world, and <laughs> good th- point. Th- th- there are a lot more universalities than th- than we think. Well, we discover that as we age. We do, because we start to see the patterns. It's right. easier to see the patterns, and you see how we are really more alike than we are different, and I think that's an important lesson in today's times. We really still are more alike than we are different. So I want to end with um, by asking you to go back uh, through your memory banks um, for a library story uh, or a reading story or a book story. You know, what's, what can you recall in terms of maybe an early memory of uh, being in a, in a public library or, or picking up a book that meant something to you or someone doing something with you that, uh, that was around reading or something around the library? Well, my first memory of a library was the Lancaster County Library. I still remember exactly where it was. I remember what it looked like. To me, it was like the, the – it, it was magical because you go someplace – I mean, even now – you go into my house, and there's just these books, books everywhere. I, I, I have a hard time getting rid of books because they're just, you know, they're, they're, there's mm-hmm. life in there. And you never know, even though, though you haven't picked one up for 20 years, all of a sudden tomorrow it might be, oh, you know what? I've got that. I've mm-hmm. got that resource there. Um, so the Lancaster County Library was like this. I thought it was a huge place. You know, these little kids, just like books everywhere. And you just want to read them all. And there's, and there's no time to do that. But I do remember sitting down having, you know, having one of these story times. And, you know, you do it at Snow Isle also where as a kid you sit down and somebody comes in and, and, and reads a story. And when you get somebody who can really read a story, you know, and make it live and breathe and just jump off the page. Now if you're reading yourself, you you kind of have to do that for yourself. Yeah. Um, but, man, when, when somebody it's, – it's like watching a magic show. Because they're creating something out of nothing. I mean, first of all, the author creates something out of nothing. This is if we're talk- talking like a fiction yes. right. book. Because, you know, when you're six years old, they're not going to, hey, it's kids reading day, and they're not going to come in and read, you know, a, you know, A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. Yeah. They're not, you know, they're going to read Dr. Seuss or something like that or Harry Potter. Um, and But the way they can just take it, – it still is amazing that, look, all it is is ink splattered over paper. That's, that's all a book is. Yeah. For you kids in the audience, books are actual <laughs> physical objects. <laughs> but it's just it's just ink splattered over paper in these weird shapes that mean nothing, and yet they mean everything. I mean, there's the whole universes live inside these things. It's um, it's an amazing experience. And then eventually, I've you know I've been to the Library of Congress, which is bigger than the Lancaster County Library, but every library is special. You know, I go to the Muckleteal Library, which is which is smaller. You know, it's it's it's, it's one of the Snow Isle libraries. But still, there's still a magical place. It's a magical place. I, I, you know, a hundred lifetimes would not be enough to read everything that's just even in a smaller library. Mm-hmm. Plus, there's such amazing parts of the community. I mean, even as a kid growing up in Lancaster, the library was always hosting things. It was a gathering place. Yes. It was a place where you know somebody would come in and give a talk or something because it's it's not just about books. It's about knowledge. It's about it's about Ideas. I mean, a library is sharing of ideas. It's just it's just like Ted. It's sharing of ideas, mm-hmm. sharing of knowledge, and the fact that it's you know this stuff is just available to us is still remarkable to me. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bill. This Thanks, has been Jim. Great. Thanks, Ken. Really appreciate it. 
That was good rehearsal. Should we do it for real now? <laughs> yeah. Well, was I supposed to be recording that? <laughs> <laughs>